Hello and welcome to another edition of On The Line, Perspectives on Partition, a series organised by the Bloody Sunday Trust in which people from diverse political and community backgrounds and with different areas of expertise and different experiences share their thoughts on one of the most significant events in modern Irish history, the partition of the island a hundred years ago this week. My name is Paul McFadden and our guest today is the County Derry born author, journalist and commentator Susan McKay. Susan, you're very welcome. First of all, you've you've Thank lived you. and you've lived and worked in, in both jurisdictions on the island, so that's I mean uh, that's an additional cause and reason for us to interview you. Um, but I, I, I'm conscious of the fact that that throughout this series we've been talking about a hundred years of history. There's this broad historical sweep to the series, and yet I want to talk to you about something that is bang up to date. That's totally topical. It, uh, I'm referring to the events of the past week when mm -hmm. Arlene Foster announced her resignation as the DUP leader. And the coincidence of, of the fact that you have a new book coming out this month, which is called Northern Protestants on Shifting Ground. Did you know something when you came up with that title? Well, of course, I've been orchestrating the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. all, you know, yeah. this is no coincidence. This Ma is my, has, uh, has this, thing on you. <laughs> this isn't a political coup. This is a this is a journalistic coup. I've I've got all the publicity I want for my new book now. No, it, it's uh, it's an extraordinary thing that has happened. I mean, we're we're just coming into the week of the centenary of the Northern Irish state and the events of the past week you know, are sufficiently cataclysmic that they could bring the end of the union altogether, you know, because it is um, really, really hard to see how unionism goes on from this moment. So it is an extraordinary thing, you know, the week, the year started out with, um, you know, the DUP hoping to have sort of garden parties and, you know, uh, flag waving and the usual sort of you know celebration of, of Protestant Britishness and and now the whole thing is imploding for them. It couldn't it couldn't be worse really. Yeah, um, and, and yet I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that you know you come from the Protestant tradition in mm -hmm. Northern Ireland, and yet I, I don't get any sense at all that that you would be one of the people out waving the flags to celebrate the centenary of the state. Why not? I think that the Protestant community, the reason I've now written two books about the Protestant community is because I really feel that it's important that people see that it's a much more diverse community than its, than its media image would suggest. You know, like there are lots of people like me who are not sort of um, hardline uh, loyalist DUP supporters. Um, there are an awful lot of people who are in mixed relationships, who are in mixed families. There's an awful lot of people who are gay or LGBTQ+. Plus, you know, there are lots of people who have decided for one reason or another that they don't support unionism at all. There's people who consider themselves Irish living in Northern Ireland who are Protestant, me among them. Uh, there are people who consider themselves Northern Irish. You know, there's a, there is a very, and, there's, and there are Protestant people in the new communities within Northern Ireland as well. So it's not the it's not the narrow picture that, that people that imagine that it is. However, of course, the majority of, of the Protestant community does vote in parties which are pro-union. And uh, that that is the core, that is the core of the Protestant um, population in the North. But I think that what has happened in the past week with, when I mean, you referred to it as the resignation of Arlene Foster, it was actually pretty much a coup against Arlene Foster. She had no choice but to resign. She was, you know, she was pushed out, very, very brutally pushed out. Um, but um, it's not at all clear what they think they were going to achieve by doing that. And I think it's, I think the DUP, has done its followers a terrible disservice in the way that it sort of treats them as if they don't have any capacity to understand ideas. You know, this notion that, you know, Arlene Foster should have just ditched the protocol, you know, ditch the protocol. There are probably hundreds, if not thousands of civil servants in several countries uh, working as we speak on, you know, the kind of documents that are required to make adjustments to the international treaty, which is Brexit, you know, and the protocol is, is a key part of that. And this notion that somebody 
from the DUP is just going to stride onto the world stage and say, right, that's it, ditch the protocol because we say so. That is absolutely not going to happen. And, you know, Boris Johnson has made it clear that he's not really interested. He's much more interested in defending his right to have other people pay for his sofas at the moment. Um, the European Union, as far as they're concerned, they're they have other things to do than constantly have to deal with fluctuations about bloody Brexit, you know, and Northern Ireland, as far as they're concerned, they have protected the Good Friday Agreement by making sure that there's no hard border in Ireland, and that's where they're going to stay. And I think that unionists are being very naive. They, they do tend to think that they're the centre of the universe, but they're not. And they really would need to look around and see that and, and see that they've, they've mishandled the thing that they seemed to most want, which was Brexit. And now they're going to have to deal with the aftermath of that. And no matter who replaces Arlene Foster, they're not going to be able to sort out the things that she wasn't able to sort out. Not least because they're not really being honest, I think, about what it is that they want. I mean, I think personally that they want rid of the Good Friday Agreement. And uh, I think that that isn't going to happen. And uh, they're going to have to come to terms with that. Northern Ireland is not going back to the days of Lord Brookborough and Craig and pre-1972 and gerrymandering and pre-civil rights. You know, the clock is not going backwards and nobody else is willing to go back with the unionists to that point. Can I ask you a question, uh, Susan? I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the diversity which exists within the mm. Protestant tradition in Northern Ireland nowadays, because uh, anybody who knows our history will will recognise the radicalism that has come mm. from uh, you know the Protestant part of the uh, community down through the centuries. But uh, before moving on to the whole issue of our partition and, and stuff like that, there, I want to ask you: Do you feel any sympathy at all for Arlene Foster? given, you know, the scale of the task that uh, she founded uh, herself confronted with, the difficulties that existed, the, 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 the problems that any DUP leader would probably have um, at, at any time in our history, but especially after Brexit and with the protocol and all of that, any sympathy at all for her? I felt sorry for her for the way that she was humiliated on the day that she was ousted. I thought it was shocking that, you know, when Sam McBride in the newsletter broke the story that there was a heave underway, uh, she went out apparently completely ignorant of the extent of, of the thing and sort of said, oh, this will this will blow over as it has always done before. And then, you know, later on the day, it became apparent that 85% of her of the MLAs had, had gone against her, including some people that she considered to be her closest allies. So I did feel sorry for her at a human level that that would happen to her. But then I was kind of also thinking, what about what she did to Theresa May? You know, I mean, Theresa May was all ready. The, the microphones were in place. The, the flags were out, you know. The announcement was to be made that Brexit had been resolved after painful years of negotiations. And then Arlene phones in and the whole thing is scuppered. Um, similarly, she ruined the Ulster Unionist Party, you know, she, when herself and Geoffrey Donaldson and Peter Weir and others walked away. You know, the Ulster Unionist Party was decimated by that split and never recovered. So she's, she can dish it out. But yeah, she certainly, in, she certainly inherited a, a very, very difficult situation. But on the other hand, she enjoyed a period of power, uh, which no Ulster Union or no unionist leader has had since before 1972 when Stormont was prorogued. I mean, she had, um, the DUP had Westminster to themselves, other than poor, valiant, brilliant Sylvia Herman, who did her best to provide an alternative voice. But otherwise, you know, they left behind the ruins of post-Brexit, you know, post-Brexit vote in Northern Ireland and just swanned around Westminster, uh, lapping it up when somebody said, our precious, precious union. They had such power. And they squandered it because um, they just held out for harder and harder and harder versions of Brexit because I think they wanted a hard border back in Ireland. And um, it blew up in their faces 
with the protocol. They backed Boris Johnson when anybody in their right mind could have seen that he didn't have their interests at heart and that he was just faking his, um, his devotion to them. And um, so she was a very, very poor strategic thinker and she was very poorly advised by those who should have been strategic thinkers around her. But she also has, you know, we, we tend not to remember the scale of the RHI yeah. debacle as well. And um, she never really kind of recovered from that either. I mean, that brought down, she was five years as leader, three years of that storm was down collapsed because Martin McGuinness said we, he, he couldn't work with someone so arrogant and that, you know, that and people were saying she was going to have to stand aside. She absolutely refused. So she and her party brazened that out and carried on. And we were three years without an executive while Brexit was under negotiation and the health service was falling apart. So her political legacy is one of irresponsibility, I think, in many ways. But at a human level, you'd have to feel for a person who was put through that hugely embarrassing, humiliating day. You know, it is strange that she didn't see it coming, though, because I think yeah, pretty much everybody else did. Astonishing, really. I think um, uh, uh, tw 20 years, 21 years ago, in an interview in The Times, you said that uh, Ulster Protestants are largely an unreflective people. Um, <laughs> I invite, invite you now to be reflective. Uh, and we'll come back because I do want to ask you one more thing towards the end of our discussion or our conversation uh, about Arlene Foster. But just looking back on the 100 years uh, of, of Northern Ireland's uh, history, uh, what are your thoughts on that, you know, event a century ago when the island was divided, when we're split into two separate political jurisdictions and uh, when you look back on all that was unleashed in the interim? Well, I think um, Jonathan Barden, the historian, put it very well in, in his book, The History of Ulster, you know, where he says about 1921, the only part of Ireland that didn't want home rule was the only part that got it. You know, Northern Ireland got home rule and um, it was not what Carson had wanted. He considered it to be the failure of his political ambitions that Northern Ireland was cut off from, from the rest of Ireland. So I think in, in terms of what... It, I think partition was a disaster for Ireland because it meant that it, we had two states, both of which were organised around the sectarian identity of the majority of their people. And, and when you say a disaster for Ireland, do you mean for both jurisdictions? Yeah, for yeah. both jurisdictions in, in Ireland, because first of all, it meant that politics was organised around a sectarian majority principle. And second of all, because it created a swathe of Ireland around the border, which was de facto marginalised from two separate jurisdictions. I mean, our city, Paul Derry, is so clearly split by the border. You know, it lost its hinterland. Donegal is particularly in a show -in, you know, sometimes feels as if it's been left in a different century, you know, because it, it has been very seriously disadvantaged by, you know, it's on a narrow, a narrow peninsula behind Northern Ireland, north of Northern Ireland. And, you know, if you look at sort of levels of industrial development and investment and all the rest along the border area, there's so, so few. And, you know, people have recently been po posting up that um, map of Ireland that shows communications, you know, railways and so on. And it's so obvious, you know, that particularly the northwest, the, the more Catholic side of, of Northern Ireland, if you like, is, um, is really disadvantaged. You know, and people people in Derry know that. I've always thought it was astonishing that when we had the Deputy First Minister was from Derry, we still didn't have a proper road between Belfast and Derry, you know, and it's only just coming into being now. And we still have a wonderfully beautiful scenic railway route that takes ours, you know. So um, I think partition was, it was very bad for the Republic as well because it turned the Republic into a Catholic state. And that was very bad news, particularly for women. And, you know, all of the legacy of that is, is just really being played out at the moment with all the stuff that's coming out about the Catholic institutions in which um, so many women and children were incarcerated over the years. So it was bad for both parts of Ireland and it held both parts of Ireland back and particularly bad for the border region. But in turn, I must go back to your, your 
quote about the unreflective people. I don't consider myself to be a Northern Protestant. I'm not a Protestant. I'm, I'm on good days, I'm, on, on strong days, I'm an atheist. On, on days when I have doubts, I'm an agnostic. But I'm not a practicing Christian of, of any kind. And I uh, would consider myself more, more of a humanist. I, I would see myself as a person from a Protestant background. Yeah, the tradition, yeah. That shapes you, it does shape you. And I do still believe that it is the case that Protestants are the, the union that unionists certainly are unreflective. They don't stop to think how they are seen by other people. They think that they can make something true by saying that it's true. You know, Ulster is safe. The union is safe. Can I, can I invite you to tell me how you think you're seen by other people? I mean, you are a woman from Northern Ireland. You're from the UK. Um, how, how do people in Dublin, for example, where you've, where you've lived, uh, re regard you? Uh, and how do, you, how do people from the Protestant tradition in Northern Ireland nowadays regard you? Well, when I wrote the first book, which was Northern Protestants and Unsettled People, which came out in 2000, I said in that, I referred in that to Northern Protestants as being the people I uneasily call my own. Mm. But now, 21 years later, with um, Northern Protestants on shifting ground, I think I've much more come to terms with being a Lundy. You know, I I am a traitor to certain obdurate traditions, but I think that that's the right way to be. And I think that there's a whole community of people who no longer uh, support the sort of notion of, you know, the binary of Catholics and Protestants and they must be at each other's throats politically and so on. So I'm much more comfortable in my identity now. And one of the things that I, I felt very, I felt it was really a quite a seismic shift in my own feeling about things was that when I, after Lyra McKee was, was um, murdered in Derry by dissident Republicans two years ago, um, I started to think about my friendship with her. I wasn't a close friend of hers, but I knew her and, and liked her and she liked me and we used to have a good laugh together and talk about politics. But I had known Lyra for quite a while before it kind of occurred to me that she was from a Catholic background. And it wasn't that I had thought she was a Protestant, it was just that it hadn't really occurred to me. And then she had said something which made me think, oh yeah, Lyra must be, must be from a Catholic background. And I was really pleased about that because, you know yourself, Paul, people of our vintage have that kind of inbuilt um, reaction that when you meet somebody, you sort of think, now would they be a Catholic or would they be a Protestant? And you don't have to mean anything bad by it. It's just a reflex that's been built into us after years of, of division. The man, you know, the, the man over my shoulder talked about the rubrics to find out name and school, stuff yeah, about yeah. and by addresses, where Norman Kean and Sydney signal fraud and Seamus call mm -hmm. me Joanne was sure a fair people. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. It's, yeah. a of, it's like a reflex action almost on people. But don't you find now with with younger people in particular, um, they don't think about that. It's, totally. I, I honestly yeah. think it's a brilliant, brilliant thing yeah. in Northern Ireland now that you meet lots of young people who look at you amazed if you ask them, <laughs> they, are they concerned about whether their friends are Catholics or Protestants or anything like that? It I think say, Susan, look, I have directly that kind of experience this very week. Mm -hmm. well, uh, my, my daughter talking about her friend of hers, and she, she didn't know what religion this individual yeah. was. And it doesn't matter to her at all what religion the person is, if they say that. Which is, it, 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 it makes me want to ask you something else. What about this issue that, uh, that goes with the, 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 the debate around the whole centenary and the celebration and all of that? The, the debate about a border poll. I mean, if there was to be a, a border poll in Northern Ireland, um, I, I've been interested in knowing when you think that might happen, first of, all, or first of all, but also if it did happen, can one say with any degree of certainty what the outcome is likely to be? Um, I don't think we can because, I mean, there have been various polls um, which are quite diverse in terms of what they suggest about the possible outcome. But the thing is, people don't yet know what shape a United Ireland might take. I mean, we're only really at a very early stage of discussions about that. And, um, you and, know, and of course, there's the Secretary of State, whoever uh, who triggers it, he mm -hmm. or she, has to uh, be of the, the view that, that a majority will. Mm -hmm. Uh, would be likely to be in favour of yeah. joining a, a new United Ireland kind of thing, if, if there's to be 
Yeah, well, I think that it's definitely become part of the conversation now. I mean, for a long time, unionism tried to not allow it to be talked about and to, to miss it as a subject of conversation, but it is being talked about now. And one of the things that surprised me when I was, was researching the book, which is based on interviews, was um, quite a lot of, of people from Protestant backgrounds, including some loyalists and including some DUP people, were reasonably relaxed about the prospect of a border poll. I mean, they would sort of say, well, don't really want one. Um, I would urge anybody I know to not vote for it, to vote to retain union. Um, but, you know, if we have to have a border poll, um, let's have it. Uh, we'll be voting to stay in the union. And quite a few people even said to me, well, and if it goes against us, so be it. This is democracy. I mean, I do think that people are in some ways more mature than unionist politics would lead you to believe. You know, there. I think that there are people who recognise that time has moved on and that, that, you know, unionism needs to move with it. Does that make you hopeful for the future? I mean, are you allowed to entertain hope at all? Um, because the young Susan McKay growing up in this city uh, and having been, you know, close to, having seen, having experienced many of the, the, the worst elements of our troubles probably back then couldn't have dared to be hopeful about the future but has that changed for you? I think that when I was younger I mean I was at school in, in Derry during the 70s and, and my big thing was to get away and I think that was the same for a lot of people of, of my generation was just you know this place is terrible I want out of it you know but I left and, and found um found that I needed to come back, you know, and, and did come back. And I, I've now sort of, as you said earlier, I, I'm backwards and forwards between the North and the South all the time. Um, I largely work in the North and I, I know the North far more intimately than I know the Republic. Um, but I don't know if I'm hopeful. I mean, I think that I think that what's happened within the DUP is is pretty scary. You know, we are we do appear to be going back to a kind of uh, fundamentalism uh, where, where there will be efforts made to get rid of abortion legislation, um, put gay people back in a fearful place, you know, um, undo human rights or, you know, take much stronger efforts to undo human rights. Um, aspects of legislation and so on. I mean, we the DUP has successfully held back on, on a lot of um, things contained in the Good Friday Agreement about human rights and reconciliation. But the thing I suppose that does make me hopeful is that I do feel that the new, the younger generations of Northern Ireland are not, don't want this nonsense. They don't want to go back to any kind of violence from what they've heard of it and what the, from what they've seen of what it's done to their parents and grandparents, they probably realise that you want to run a mile from that kind of thing. Um, and I think that lots of people who in the past would have just left Northern Ireland are now determined to stay because in many ways it's a really nice place and in many ways it has a lot going for it. And people have good relationships with other people here, they're part of movements that they believe in, and also they're part of global movements. You know, I, I think that the, the climate justice movement is, is strong in Northern Ireland, as you see from the, the way that the Green Party is, is thriving, and uh, a lot of NGOs and groups springing up that are, are more concerned about the survival of the planet than the survival, the survival of Northern Ireland or the constitutional future of Northern Ireland. So I think that the young people of Northern Ireland are very determined, many of them, to, to make this place better. And that, that's a really good thing. And remember, of course, that Lear McKee's uh, statement, you know, let no one tell me there is no hope, has in many ways been taken up as a kind of a slogan by a lot of people today. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what, what does it take for, you know, big politics. I mean, when you consider there is no sort of graver threat to us than the threat to the planet, uh, hugely important, uh, something which is recognised by many, many, you talk to any sort of teenagers mm -hmm. in schools nowadays, they see the problem, they, they, they can hear the klaxon sounding kind of, you know. What does it take for that to trump 
uh, small constitutional matters and in, in, in the grand sweep of things. I mean, uh, relatively insignificant things like the line on the map that we're talking about in this series and, and to face up to the big, big problems that threaten, that, that face all of us, whether you're Catholic, Protestant, Unionist, Nationalist, male, female, gay, straight, doesn't matter. We're confronted with a, this awesome threat to our future as a species. Well, it's not detached from the, the border issue. I mean, if you look, for example, at the fracking issue down in Fermanagh, the Fermanagh of Leitrim border area, you know, that's that's an example of um, big businesses wanting to ruin uh, a beautiful, fragile uh, ecosystem and landscape in the interest of making a uh, swift profit and then just kind of leaving a ruined place behind them. And there are movements, uh, there are groups on both sides of the border who are working together uh, very strenuously to try to stop that happening. They've succeeded in the Republic, they haven't as yet succeeded in the North. And that is still a, a battle that's going on. But so I don't think that these things are separate from each other. Um, I think that unfortunately the obsession with the constitutional issue here has meant people have been putting a lot of energy into that that they could have been putting into other things and that's very frustrating. But we are going to have to resolve the constitutional issue in Ireland, the border the border issue has got to be resolved. The border issue in the Irish Sea has got to be resolved. Um, we're too small a place to be surrounded by two borders. You know, it was bad enough having one, now we've got two. Um, we could do without both of them, really. But um, yeah, that's going to have to be resolved. But it, it's because the discussion about it is so sectarianized. Um, it's dominating and it shouldn't be dominating. It should be part of a wider discussion about you know, how do we make this country a country that is better contributing to making the world a safer place? Uh, oh, that, that kind of brings me nicely to you later on. I want to come back to Arlene Foster's, uh, well, imminent resignation, but in, in her uh, resignation speech, she said, I'm going to quote this if you don't mind, Susan, there are people in Northern Ireland with a British identity, others are Irish, others are Northern Irish, others are a mixture of all three, and some are new and emerging. We must all learn to be generous to each other, live together and share this wonderful country. The future of unionism and Northern Ireland will not be found in division, it will only be found in sharing this place we are all privileged to call home. Um, I, I want to get your thoughts on that. I'm all, I want to also go back to the point you talked yourself about, described yourself earlier on as a, a traitor, a Lundy. I would actually argue, you know, that if, if, if you think that, that that's what's best for people here um, is pointing them in a different direction, that, that is not treachery, that's bravery in my opinion. Well, but that's the problem with unionism and funny enough, Arlene herself. <laughs> it's a problem probably in nationalism as well, actually. Uh, Arlene herself compared herself to Lundy recently. She said the problem with unionism is um, that they tend, when they're in difficulty, they tend to look for a Lundy. And it's now obvious that she meant herself, that she could see them circling and looking for a scapegoat, which is what she's been turned into. But just in relation to her um, her parting speech. I mean, I'm say people's mouths were dropping open because it was absolutely gorgeous. You know, it was like the good Friday <laughs> moment all over again. You know, the generosity of it, the the pluralism contained in it, the the sweetness. You know. Um, which is not what you associate with Arlene Foster. I mean, I think that there's part of her that really means what she's saying, but why is she saying it now? Why didn't she say it five years ago? Why did she talk about rogues and renegades? Uh, you know, remember the time, was it in 2017, when Peter Robinson had stepped aside and he put her in his place? Um, before she, it was whenever, it was before she became First Minister anyway, she was acting First Minister and she said it was because she had to look after the money and stop rogues and renegades in Sinn Féin and the SDLP from getting at it, you know, which was a really ugly sectarian thing to say. And then, you know, she talked about crocodiles and if you feed the crocodiles, they'll keep coming back for more. And she didn't really take action against Gregory Campbell when he talked about, you know, if there was an Irish language act, he would use it as toilet paper. She didn't take action against Paisley Jr. when he talked about the Catholic IRA. You know, she didn't take action against John Carson when he said the pandemic had been sent because um, 
the pandemic had been sent because by God, because we had legislated for abortion on same sex marriage, you know, all these appalling, intolerant, um, narrow, divisive, hateful things that were said. And, you know, she has supported really homophobic policies. She's supported uh, not allowing women to have the same um, reproductive rights as women in the rest of the UK and Ireland. You know, she hasn't been generous and she hasn't supported reconciliation and pluralism. I mean, it was really nice to know that she has finally recognised that that is where Northern Ireland should go, but... But she's, you think too, she doesn't know. She's leaving it, you know. Yeah, but we think too, though, that, that uh, in fairness, I mean, the other side of it is that she did come to long to her church for mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. uh, wreck of mass for former IRA leader, Martin McGuinness. She did come to, to Derry, to Craigan, uh, into a Republican mm -hmm. heartland and stand with hundreds and hundreds of people protesting against the murder of, of, of your friend, Lyra McKee. So mm -hmm. there were these contradictions. There, there, were, yeah. there were brave steps within that too, you know. There were contradictions and um, I think that she does have better instincts, you know, but I think that she found herself trapped in the DUP where she was already seen as a bit of an outsider. She'd come from the Ulster Unionist Party. She hadn't come from the sort of hardcore Paisleyite um, free Presbyterian background and uh, there was a certain element of, of suspicion towards her among that more fundamentalist wing of the party so I think that she'd sort of she would do something brave and decent like going to Derry for those events that you talked about and then she would revert to try to send a signal that um, don't worry I'm not softening you know so there was there was it's like the dilemma that the party is in now that she has left them with is that they're they're losing people to the TUV at one end who who just want to go right back, not just to 1972, but to 1921, you know, and uh, do the whole thing over again, but this time not let the Good Friday Agreement happen. And on the other hand, she's got progressive young people who support the union, but are moving towards alliance or the Greens or out of political voting union, democratic unionism altogether, you know, so she's, she's left the party polarised in that way, but it always had that inner contradiction, you know, I don't think unionism knows how to be a peacetime political force, you know, it's, it's a very defensive politics, it's very much sort of, you know, when the Ulster man's back is against the wall, he'll fight, you know, and no surrender and close the gates, you know, it's not, it's not about negotiation and compromise and, you know, generosity. It's, it's afraid not to be vigilant. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll mention again that uh, your, your new book is coming out later this month, uh, Northern Protestants on Shifting Ground. It's published by Blackstaff Press. I, I want to, by way of conclusion, uh, go back to the book you mentioned earlier on, uh, Northern Protestants and Unsettled People, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, was published 20, 21 years ago. Um, I, I want to throw a quote at you uh, from that, Susan. You, you, mm -hmm. In that book, you quoted Winston Churchill saying that the temporary borders soon harden into permanence. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose 20 years ago, you, uh, when one thought about that statement by Churchill, we thought about the the de jure border uh, on, on the map on, on the island of Ireland. Now with this other border, a de facto border down the Irish Sea, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering in your opinion, uh, to, to draw our conversation to close, which of those two borders is likely to prove the more permanent? <laughs> I think that's impossible to say, but I definitely think the existence of the border in the Irish Sea is going to make people think again about whether we can sustain the border in Ireland and also whether Ireland wouldn't be better off uh, as part of a whole island which was within the European Union and I think that will become an even more pressing question um, when Scotland potentially votes to, to leave the UK and, and potentially also votes to return therefore to the EU, you know, because if you've got sort of Scotland with, with which Northern Irish Protestants feel a very strong connection and with which we are very close neighbours. Um, if, if Scotland goes 
and the Republic of Ireland is in the EU. Northern Ireland is sort of sandwiched between those two land masses. And it's it's been painfully obvious that England doesn't care. Tory England definitely doesn't care. I mean, there was a poll that showed that um, a majority of Tories would rather lose Northern Ireland than have to give up on Brexit. So it is already clear that we're not wanted there. So I think that is causing people who would have at one stage just sort of, without thinking about it very much, thought of themselves as being unionists. I think that a lot of those people will find that they will be actually being considering things in quite a, a sensible way in terms of um, you know what their their future might be better off being. Shouldn't Scotland goes it love the UK anymore? It'll just be the K, I suppose, you know, and <laughs> different ball game entirely. Look, thanks a million for for joining us. Just remind people that your new book, Northern Protestants on Shifting Ground, published by Blackstaff Press, is coming out, I think, in the next three weeks, within the next three weeks. Yeah, and actually, my uh, original book, Northern Protestants and Unsettled People, is being reissued alongside it. And I'm just, I'm going to slightly move my computer here to show you the, uh, it's actually going to revert to the original cover, which was oh, this beautiful, yeah. beautiful, as, as, as opposed to, as opposed to that one. <laughs> I, hated that, I hated that cover, I always hated that cover. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. The Kelvin Boys one is, is is a photograph from Drum Cree, which was very current at the time of the uh, that the last book came out. And in a way, I think we're back in a Drum Cree period, except that there isn't the appetite for it anymore among a much bigger majority of of Protestants and Unionists. I think that a lot of people have settled quite well to peace and don't want the disruption to their lives uh, or the pain and loss that could go with it with, with it being broken down. Well, long may that remain the case. Uh, Susan, thanks a million and people can buy either of those books or both of them. I would say you'd prefer to buy both of them. <laughs> uh, and, and I'll tell you what, they'll be better uh, educated for, for reading them. Susan McKay, thank you very much indeed for coming uh, along virtually and joining us for a conversation and agreeing to share your views on the line with your perspective on partition. It's been a pleasure and an education talk to you, Susan. So thank you very much. Thank you.